Hello and welcome Desert Mountain members to another edition of the Desert Mountain Podcast. This is a very special edition. It's probably the largest podcast we've ever had. We've got seven uh, folks here with us this morning. Uh, So let's just jump right into it. My name is Michael Craven. I'm joined by Kim Atkinson. Hello, Kim. Hello, Michael. Joined by our CFO, Andrea Randall. Hello, Andrea. Hi, Michael. Hello, Desert Mountain. <laughs> and uh, across from me, my, my partner and associate, uh, Patrick McKenzie. Hello, Patrick. Hello, Michael. Good to be here again. Kim, we have uh, some folks joining us on the screen today. Uh, would you like to introduce them? They're from GGA. They're from Global Golf Advisors. They're joining us from Canada. And uh, we, we saved them the trip. Uh, they've been out here quite a bit throughout the last several months to do a lot of research on Desert Mountain. But today, calling in to share some insights from Global Golf Advisors. So I will let our friends from Global Golf begin to introduce themselves, starting with Liz. Good morning, or hello, uh, Kim and Desert Mountain. I'm Liz McDowell, and I'm a director with GGA uh, and former club manager. So happy to be here and was thrilled to be part of this project. Wonderful. Martin. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Great, great to be here. My name is Martin Sankov, and I'm a senior manager at the GGA Partners. And yeah, I've been working with uh, Desert Mountain for a few months now. And yeah, it's been great and happy to, sh- to share the insights today. Well, welcome. And Derek. Yeah, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, Derek Johnston, a partner with GGA. Um, I've been with GGA for 14 years now and, uh, yeah, enjoyed very much working with Desert Mountain. Wonderful. And um, several cities uh, headquartered within the GGA um, company. So uh, your office is located where exactly and then where else do you have offices throughout the, the, the country and globally? Yeah, great question. We have offices in Toronto, which is where the three of us are located. Uh, we also have offices in Phoenix, uh, quite quite close to where you are all uh, sitting right now. Um, we have an office in um, uh, Hilton Head um, and an office in Dublin, Ireland. Um, wow. And so we have a team that's spread out uh, all across North America and uh, through Europe. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, um, a little bit more about GGA. Tell us what is kind of the the breadth, the scope of work uh, coming out of Global Golf Advisors and uh, help us understand a little bit more about your company. Yeah, sure. We, uh, I guess, easiest way to describe it, we're a boutique management consulting firm um, and we're pretty much dedicated to helping private clubs, uh, golf and lifestyle communities. and uh, we actually originated as a specialty practice back at KPMG um, in 1992. Um, we transitioned out of KPMG in 2006, um, renamed the practice Global Golf Advisors, and have been operating. We operated as Global Golf Advisors through 2020, and we condensed our name just recently in 2020 um, to GGA Partners. Uh, we were doing a lot of work with clubs that had golf as a key amenity but also clubs that perhaps didn't have golf, Um, city clubs and yacht clubs. And um, I think uh, some of the board members at those clubs were um, (laughs) were trying to figure out why they kept hiring golf consultants in their minds, right? And so uh, the nice part is we come from professional practice. Uh, I think one of our our core practice areas is strategy and operations consulting, um, which is essentially the, the team that worked on this Desert Mountain project here. Um, And, uh, you know, we, I think, Let's see. We really enjoy helping clients problem solve. Um, we uh, we have an awesome database um, from all of our our client work. Um, I think we've had a chance to work with over three thousand clients now um, since our inception, um, and uh, we just enjoy identifying and helping to share best practices from all across the country, um, and then working with uh, management teams and, and club leaders, board members to figure out how to actually adapt those best practices to you know your unique circumstances. Um, and, uh, I guess maybe the last thing I'd say about GGA, um, you know, what, what sets us apart, it, it's really our investment in industry research and advanced analytics. Um, and that's, you know, both of those things were really important to our work here with Desert Mountain. The advanced analytics for sure. And, and so when Desert Mountain called for assistance on this study, um, what, what was that assignment? What we, we were looking for a deep dive into our data. Andrea Randall and her team uh, provided a lot of material. Um, Andrea, I'll let you kind of start this out in terms of 
the different databases that we shared and uh, provided to GGA. Sure, absolutely, Kim. Mm -hmm. um, yes, we provided GGA with direct access to our total e system, which you know houses all of our membership level detail, our point of sale activity. So, you know, food and beverage, dining, covers. They also had direct access to Four Ts, of course, which um, has all of our great information on the golf side. Um, the one area of the club that we still need to improve upon in terms of having rich data uh, that's accurate and reliable is you know, the usage of the Sonoran Club. So uh, GGA was able to work with what they had, but we need to continue to improve in that area. And, of course, they also had access to Club Essentials um, to look at reservation information to the extent that would help um, as they evaluated our utilization versus our capacity. And so the assignment at hand, right? Here comes Desert Mountain, makes the phone call, ready to hire GGA. Um, what in your mind was that assignment uh, described as, and, and how did you uh, proceed once we initiated contact? Also a great question. <laughs> Maybe I'll take I'll take the first stab at it, and Liz, uh, Martin, feel welcome to jump in. I mean, the first phone call we got was, okay, we, we really need somebody to help us analyze our capacity and our utilization um, and help us better understand, you know, what our capacity is, how close we are to that capacity, and how that impacts our membership. Um, and the number of members we have and how our members are currently using the club versus how they will likely use the club in the future um, and what type of strategies are out there to help us, you know, make sure we're best positioned to, you know, support our, our members' satisfaction going forward. Very good. Le uh, Liz, did you have anything you wanted to add? I was just going to add that the, the official brief was very much as Derek described it. And what we learned from discussions with the management team uh, was that it was very important to understand um, if we were to start from scratch and try to decide what the right number of members is, what would that membership be? So um, that was one of the other things that we we tried to, to answer to give some guidance on throughout the project. And then Martin, I know um, just in your visits as well with, with Liz and Derek, um, let's talk about that process. What was your initial approach? Um, first steps out of the gate. Yeah, so first steps were definitely, you know, as Andrea mentioned, all the data we had access to and trying to kind of organize everything. And I'd say the first step usually is always starting with the membership roster and taking a look at here's exactly who the members are, who's the primary, the secondary, the dependent, just looking at everybody who, you know, has access to the club. And an important step there is you know, converting all of those members into memberships. So like member accounts and in the reports, you know, that members can go through and the, the, the videos, we often reference memberships or households. We like to look at it as a membership unit and how many rounds, covers, spending, et cetera, that entire, you know, household contributes. So that takes a lot of work initially just to turn it from members to memberships and have you know, those account IDs sort of speaking to those other uh, areas where data is housed. So, you know, how Andrea mentioned 4Ts, all the tee times uh, data, it's like a great tool with all the tee times and rounds, but it doesn't have anything on how old the, the players are, the mem you know, all the demographic stuff that would be in Total E, for example. So trying to kind of combine all that and tying it back to the membership roster with the most important data points there on, you know, when did the members join? Um, how old are they? Are they a property owner or not? Um, even what area in Desert Mountain are they uh, residing in? Um, how large is their household as far as people? Is it, you know, a couple household? Is it a couple with, you know, three children? So just adding all of those parameters like into the data. That was probably the first step and most important part of sort of setting up the data in a way that, you know, we could analyze it. That's a great setup. And so I know um, at the onset, too, you had listed in your deliverables to issue a member survey. 
and get some good, deep questions answered out of our membership. We had already engaged with Chambers, as you know, to do kind of part two of a survey series that we were in the middle of. So we partnered with you to create that and uh, get that out to the members and ask those questions about usage and satisfaction. And so I know a lot of that uh, information was pulled into your resolutions and and your data points as well. Um, And that's why we kind of packaged all of this together for our members and put it in the Mountain Minute for them. So now we're on to kind of some takeaways. I know Andrea, um, the leadership team, our board, um, we've seen the presentations now a couple of times and uh, have, have some key takeaways that come out of it. Andrea, what would you say is kind of one of the the major um, takeaways that members should be looking for? Sure. (laughs) Yes. As Liz mentioned, um, you know, what was very important to management and the board was to really understand the ideal membership count. Yeah. Um, That that was a critical question that we needed to ask and and understand how we manage it going forward. And I would say the biggest takeaway um, from my perspective was, you know, we have become too focused on a number and that we need to manage um, our membership levels in light of our utilization on an ongoing basis. This is not a one and done initiative uh, because our members today using the club might look very different in six months. And so it, it's not going to be about a number. It's going to be about, a, you know, potentially a range, but also more about are we maintaining, are we growing, or are we restricting, as the GGA team is recommending, that we focus on in terms of managing our membership levels going forward? I, I thought that was a great recommendation. Uh, it gets us less focused on a number, which is very difficult um, for us to manage to a single number, and, and makes us think more about the long term as well as continuing to monitor it, that we can't lose sight of the fact that our utilization is not going to be the same yeah. today as it was yesterday or tomorrow. Correct. And same, same takeaways from, from my team as well. And, um, hearing sort of the descriptions of, you know, maybe it isn't so much about how many we are, but who we are as a membership and what we are doing with our time and how we are using the club has changed. So, um, there was a, a quite a bit of information shared in our mountain minute, um, I would have to say it could be more called a mountain multiple minutes uh, to really get into it because we, we included a lot of video and the the reporting that you all have provided. We tried to break it down, and you did a great job, Liz, um, narrating us through that. So thank you for doing that. There's more to come. So we have an additional report that is accompanying today's podcast uh, for members to flip through that as well and and see what takeaways they might have through this process. Um, so the, that is that is really a, a relevant topic for us to, to land on. Um, anything else from the GGA side? What were some of the key takeaways um, in addition to kind of the, the usage versus the number piece that we just referenced? Yeah, good question. I'd, there's so much stuff I... Um, I think, I think a big one and we cover well, uh, you know, in in the PowerPoints that Liz went through and you'll see in the report is just how much more people are using the club, uh, you know, kind of post pandemic or, you know, after 2020 basically. And that's not necessarily unique to desert mountain. I think a lot of, a lot of clubs of course experience that. And maybe a key difference is that, you know, some clubs that maybe weren't weren't as successful as Desert Mountain was before that, maybe had the capacity to absorb the additional uh, rounds played, the additional, you know, memberships, whereas Desert Mountain, you know, it it was already a successful club. And, you know, the additional play from everyone sort of added to that um, capacity constraint. And so um, everyone playing a lot more was definitely... uh, interesting to see and look into the data, but again, not unique to, uh, to desert mountain. That's and, right. Um, yeah. And I was curious too, about the other clubs that you, uh, look at and study and some consistencies maybe that you're hearing from other clients. Um, what are some of those clubs and what, are, how do we compare? Obviously we're, we've got a geographic and a demographic and a size that's very unique to desert mountain, but our, um, the desire to golf, Obviously, that story has been told time and again that it was the winner 
uh, coming out of COVID and really curious just to hear, you know, just some comparisons from other stories of, and why we hired you again was your experience with other clubs. So a little insight there, I think would be great. Uh, yeah, I can I can chime in there first. I mean, um, I, I'd say we're really fortunate to work with some fantastic clubs all across the country. Um, and I think something that's perhaps um, helpful and unique is that we work with clubs similar to Desert Mountain um, that are you know member owned. We work with clubs that are privately owned. We work with clubs that are still developer owned. Um, and each one of those different types of clubs, you know, have different challenges, um, different circumstances that they're facing. Um, but something that seems to be quite consistent, regardless of of the ownership structure or, or type of club, um, is the 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 balancing act between the member experience and long term financial sustainability. Um, and you know, when you think back historically to the way membership capacities and caps were developed. Um, you know, they were always quite rigid numbers. Um, and I think something we've learned over the years, it's certainly through the last few years, um, is that, you know, that rigid number can cause some significant challenges on the member experience side. Um, when you when you hit a waitlist scenario and when you are faced with you know, increasing demand and members exp- using the facilities far more. Um, but then also on the financial um, long term sustainability side, because members are saying, whoa, this is this is too much. This is too, you, our experience has changed. Um, what can we do about it? Um, and there's there's only so many levers that private clubs have to pull. Um, and one of those levers is significantly increasing the cost to the long. Um, which can be quite challenging because there's risks associated with it. Um, and so uh, clubs across the, c- the country, certainly at the top of the market, um, and as Martin alluded to, clubs that were really close to being full already before the pandemic, you know, they've, they've had some real challenges just with the change in member experience. Um, and I think one of the things that will be interesting to see over the next year or two um, is how things change post pandemic. And as we get further and further from the pandemic, um, and I think, you know, that kind of feeds into some of our recommendations here for Desert Mountain um, and having a mode um, and monitoring um, and adjusting as as members um, patterns change and shift um, to be able to have that flexibility in order to actually, you know, address address those changes. It's a, it's a great question and a tricky one. There are really only three or, or limited levers that you have at your disposal in order to address capacity. And certainly we've identified three main levers in our report. What we are seeing is that the best practice, first and foremost, is to optimize the existing capacity that you have available through the use of policy or procedural changes that you have at your disposal before you start introducing more permanent changes. So things like capacity expansion or membership restriction. Um, At Desert Mountain, a really good example of that is as far as our recommendation goes relating to the tea time booking policies. So our suggestion is that before you introduce a more permanent change, first you look at adjusting the algorithm to make sure that it works as advantageously as possible to assign your tea times more equitably across the membership. At other clubs across the country, we are certainly noticing a theme of reducing some of the play that's not directly available for the benefit of the primary members. So, for instance, looking at how their guest privileges are assigned or or how tea times are assigned for junior golf play, things like that, that can work really well. Um, But you do need to be very cautious when you introduce any new restrictions to play um, because there are always uh, additional ramifications of adjusting, of making those adjustments. So being sensitive, for instance, to how your full playing members might feel about having guest access adjusted um, is something that you want to be really careful of because it can be tricky. That's a great answer. And I think that really segues well into, you know, some of the work that the the management team did over the summer and as a result of the member survey that, you know, we we appreciate and recognize the scope and breadth of work that went into the data study. But we also know that we've been experiencing capacity challenges that we need to address. And so so that's where members are, um, our documents came to be that you'll see in your Mountain Minute. We have uh, winter season capacity hans- enhancements for dining uh, over at the Sonoran Clubhouse and for golf 
uh, just to create more opportunity for members to enjoy the club. So you talk about those levers, Derek, and there's been a ton of creativity that went into developing a brand new dinner venue, for example, that didn't exist last year. And now we're going to have a pizza kitchen in November, which is awesome. Um, so, uh, moving upstairs to have lunch at Constantino's and you still get the patio view, but then you can come back for dinner as well. So it's, it's pretty great. That's great. That's a great point, Kim. And I think what you've described is an excellent example of being able to appropriately use policy to adjust your capacity rather than having to expand your capacity right out of the gate. All right. So, uh, that was a little plug for the, the desert mountain, um, recommendations and, and initiatives that are in place now. And of course, those that have been uh, recommended by GGA are under review um, and more to come on which of those we will be applying or adopting or adjusting uh, for our members going forward. Kim, yeah. I was just going to add one thing. Yeah. You know, these capacity recommendations that we announced uh, yesterday are, are really important um, for us because what we're trying to do right now is find a way to expand capacity. So we're, that will provide more access to the membership and of course improve the experience. That is the first step um, in, in what we're trying to pursue going forward. We are in a kind of a wait and see mode in terms of the membership levels because the goal is if we can expand capacity, uh, then we can maybe maintain membership levels um, in the near term, but of course we'll continue to check in on those membership levels. Um, because as you'll see in the videos that uh, GGA provided with us, there's a significant financial um, implication if we change membership levels uh, significantly lower. And at the same time, if we're not picking up um, more access or capacity for the membership, then is the membership really benefiting, but yet now we're, we're, we're costing the club more. Um, it's an opportunity cost. So that's why the first step is let's expand capacity. We are talking about these capacity initiatives weekly. There may be more that mm-hmm. our team member will discover in the next couple of weeks, and we will roll it out and communicate with the membership. So I, I just didn't want to underestimate how important these initiatives are. They really have, um, the ones we launched late last year, have made a significant improvement already, and, and we expect um, these these new initiatives to continue to take us in the right direction. Off peak hour dining incentives is a great example. Yep, exactly. It was, it really did improve um, more dining. I see it in the average check. Our average check is lower right now year over year because we're providing a promotion to the membership. But as long as that um, provides a, a greater experience for the membership, provides them access to the club, it was a great decision. Fantastic. So that one is a rollover from last season. It is. For sure. Um, I wanted to address the open table piece. Um, you know, that will give members the ability to see availability across multiple venues. So we're excited to roll that out. And um, you came up, you raise a good point. There may be more. There is more that didn't even make this uh, document yesterday. Greg Leonard called us and said, hey, I've got another one. Um, we're going to have some painters lounge events move to seven And so the painters are going to love being out in the open air and have all that bright light for painting. And that created more opportunity for pasta night and more seats uh, to become available for those who like to come and have pasta. So you'll see those and hear about those and and, and experience those as they come along. So we're we're proud of our teams for developing those those capacity initiatives. Oh, yes, definitely. I was thinking about Greg when I thought about there'll be more. Yes. Greg's got an idea every hour of the day. He really does. (laughs) Very, very, very much so. Well, good. And um, I think that's a pretty good nutshell. Um, We're going to have you all um, provide some additional reporting that's included in this Thursday Mountain Minute. Uh, So a lot of information for our members. For those who like to get into the details, we want to tee that up for them. So thank you for all of your excellent work over the last several months and for working with us. It's been a great partnership. And Andrea, anything else for the team? Yes, I just want to stress, please continue to watch the videos. We are here to answer any questions uh, going forward. And as we uh, make some decisions about some additional recommendations, we will we will definitely communicate to the membership. Um, our, we are passionate and care so much about improving your experience making sure you can access our club when you want to access it. And um, we look forward to a great winter season. Fantastic. All right. Well, thank you, GGA, for joining us. 
Patrick Thank Michael. Thank you. That was an easy one for us. Yeah. <laughs> you guys did all the talking. <laughs> That's all right. It's all good. We'll Thanks be, we'll be uh, doing the outdoor uh, recreation piece here. Outdoor yeah, adventures, I think, are fun. coming soon. So yeah. we'll, we'll have a roll. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, members, for joining us. Until Thank you, everyone. Until next time. Yep. We'll see you on the mountain. See you around the mountain. <laughs>